Hello. This week we're talking about the international nature of cybercrime. In past weeks you've learned about different types of cybercrime and how they worked, how criminals used technology to commit crime. This week we're talking about how criminals connect or work with different countries or criminals around the world uh, to be able to commit crime. So in this lesson so far, I think you've seen that cybercrime is global. Computers all over the world can connect to each other very easily, very quickly, and criminals are using that to be able to uh, commit crime at a global scale. So in this case, whenever we're using technology, even domestic crimes tend to have some sort of international component. So if I'm committing a crime in the country that I'm resident in, and the victim is also resident in that country, we tend to see that services outside of that country are also used in the committing of that crime. So consider, for example, email chat servers hosted in another country. The victim and the criminal might be in the same country, but they've used an email service, for example, in the US or in another country. Uh, botnets, especially. I believe we've talked about botnets already. Botnets essentially take over computers from many different countries and then remote control all of those computers for one specific task normally. In that case, there might be hundreds of countries involved in, in, in that cybercrime or are part of that botnet. The other aspect of, of cybercrime being global is that everything is real time. With technology, um, we have instantaneous communications. Think about Facebook or Twitter. We can communicate with our friends anywhere in the world in real time. Cyber criminals also take advantage of that and connect to other criminal networks or their victims or uh, whoever they want to connect to, other services, anywhere in the world also in real time. This makes it especially difficult for law enforcement because one criminal based in one jurisdiction could be accessing many different jurisdictions and committing crimes in real time uh, for long periods of time before they're detected um, and before we can actually respond. Another big issue with cybercrime, uh, internationally speaking, is an anonymity. anonymity. So, for example, positive attribution is extremely difficult with international crime or cybercrime in general. Trying to attribute some action to a specific actor um, becomes very, very hard whenever you're connecting or anyone in the world that's connected to the internet could be making that connection. And part of the reason is um, the way that it, the internet is set up is completely distributed. So we're not really sure who is connecting uh, to us at all times. Um, that makes it very difficult for investigations because even if we get an IP address, we can't always attribute it to the person doing the action. Um, so to talk a little bit more about networking and IP addresses, think about your, your local area network. Something in your house, for example, you might have a router and you might have a couple home computers or phones connected to that router. They can all talk to each other even if you don't have the internet. They can connect through this home wireless router and still communicate with each other. That also means that if someone else got on your home network, they could also connect to your devices and attack them or network with them or whatever they want to do. So these local area networks are things like homes, schools, businesses, they all tend to have their own local area networks and then they connect to the internet and that connects them to other local area networks. These other local area networks could be anywhere else in the world. Then we have national services, which are basically governments, um, government services that are provided only nationally or national service providers. So our ISPs in the country, they are running national networks and they control the communications essentially between local area networks on a national scale in the country. Then we have global services and that's where basically IP version four, IP version six addressing as long as a computer in any other country um, as long as there's some sort of physical connection between them in some way and there's an addressing system to be able to connect to them, then we can connect to that computer globally. Now these global services, they aren't, um, they are regulated by some organizations that try to do things like standardization, but there's no one government overseeing the way that these things um, uh, act essentially, just the way that they communicate. Uh, so what we have is computers or devices all over the world 
with an assigned address that anyone can connect to, and that can connect to basically anyone on the internet, and we don't necessarily know who's behind that or what's behind that. We might not even necessarily be able to place where that's located because, like we've talked about before, they could go through other computers to do their communication. There's also somewhat a disconnect between don domain names and IP addresses. So, for example, if you type in uh, www.halim.ac.kr, ac.kr looks like it's going to be a university in Korea. However, that domain name could point to any IP address in the world. It might not necessarily be pointing to Korea. It could be pointing to the US or Russia or wherever else. And humans use these domain names to connect to resources online. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're in the country that we think they are. And all of these have implications for the way that cyber criminals actually conduct or commit cyber crimes. So talking about some types of cyber crimes that are extremely common, um, going into the international aspects a little bit more than we have before. Uh, first off, basic fraud. Whenever we're talking about basic fraud, especially in Korea, um, these frauds are usually very, very simple, like online auction fraud, uh, where I want to buy something, um, so I send the money to you, but you never send me the product. This is in Korea at least considered a cyber crime because it was committed mostly online especially with bank transfers and things like that but I didn't receive my package so it's considered fraudulent um, in these types of cases they're usually uh, moderate to low in organization it's usually maybe one or two people they're not extremely organized they're stealing small amounts of money but it still affects a lot of people because you can do it very very quickly and uh, even though it's small amounts of money make a lot of money relatively quickly. So law enforcement in Korea focus on these kind of small frauds quite a bit. In other countries, not so much, especially if the amounts are low, and we'll talk about that in a second. They're very often domestic. So in this case, the criminal and the victim tend to be in the same country uh, for, for smaller frauds. Uh, both the victim and attacker are likely in the same country, and some components may still be international. So even if the suspect and the victim are both in the same country, they might be using Gmail, which may be hosted in the US. So in that case, we still have an international component if we want to actually investigate that case using email. Uh, most of the time, because of the difficulties in international cooperation or the time that it takes to receive and requ uh, request and receive these emails uh, from other countries, we tend to save those for uh, the last. If we if we can't find any other information, then we'll go for, um, for example, emails from other countries. Uh, more on an international scale. So small frauds, for example, basic fraud, you might have a couple servers or email servers located in other countries. But for advanced fraud, you're talking um, a lot of different countries involved and a lot of different services involved from many different places. In these cases, advanced fraud, there's a more complicated setup. There's usually a lot more organization, a lot more initial investment in infrastructure and setup costs to do these advanced frauds, and a lot more planning that goes into it. Uh, so higher level of organization, we're looking at fraud groups now, we're looking potentially at organized criminals rather than just one or two people by themselves, um, and more often international targeting. So these organized groups, um, because they have presumably a few more resources and a little bit more knowledge, they can also target internationally a little bit more effectively. That means that you have a criminal that's not in the victim's jurisdiction. They're in basically two different countries, and you might have infrastructure technology being used in other countries as well. So this very quickly becomes a huge challenge for law enforcement because the two countries, if they want to solve this crime, where the victim is and where the criminal is, they have to work together. And there might be several countries in the middle of that as well. So cybercrime becomes very easy to be international. Almost everything we do normally goes outside of the jurisdiction of our local police, which means most types of cybercrime, even if they have an international, if they have an international component, um, it just makes it very, very difficult for these countries to start to communicate and work together. So aside from frauds, we also have botnets. Botnets, um, there's lots of different ways that a computer might be joined to a botnet. I won't go into the technical details, 
But just think about the international implications of that. If I release, for example, a virus that attacks Windows 10, um, that virus could potentially infect millions of computers all around the world. In that case, if I'm located, for example, in Korea, and I control a botnet that has potentially hundreds of other countries involved in it, how should an investigator or a victim in some country um, complain to their local police officers and how would those police actually investigate me? It becomes very, very difficult um, to essentially trace back to the actual suspect um, when we're dealing with large-scale botnets. Again, botnets probably also run by um, at least an organized criminal or kind of a, a criminal providing a service. So usually we want to create, usually criminals want to create botnets um, for things like distributed denial of service, for things like spamming, sending spam emails where they would make money off of, uh, sniffing network traffic. So if your computer is infected, the criminal might want to steal your network traffic and sell the information that they get from that. Uh, key logging, same thing. Uh, spreading new malware so they could potentially take over your computer and use your computer to send viruses or other things to other people's computers as well. Uh, ad manipulation, so they might use the botnet to make your computer look like it's clicking on an ad and then they make the money off of that ad click. Uh, manipulating online polls, so recently there's been quite a few cases where people have tried to use botnets to manipulate online voting systems for uh, presidential elections or whatever. Um, in several different countries. Um, and of course, identity theft. So again, taking the information from that computer and getting the identity of that user and usually selling it online. Uh, again, that could potentially involve millions of people all over the world. So, for example, if the criminal was in Korea and I was attacking, or the, the person who had their computer infected by the botnet was in the UK. How does that person in the UK go about making a claim? They would have to go to their local police. Their local police would have to open a case and then investigate this whole botnet to try to bring it back to Korea. And then the UK police would have to work with Korea to apprehend the suspect. That's a very long, very, very difficult process. But for the criminal side, it's relatively easy. Um, Something else I've worked on before are chip and pin card skinner, skimmers. So this is, uh, for example, whenever you're going to a pay system at a supermarket or whatever, and you use your chip and pin card, you have to put your card in and then put in your pin number to do the transaction. Um, people are creating chip and pin card skimmers where whenever you put in your card, um, there's essentially a computer inside of it listening for your card information. Whenever you put your pin number in, it takes all of that information and sends it to a server somewhere. So what this looks like in terms of international cooperation is um, one criminal might have an idea or they might design this chip and pin card skimmer. They are based in, let's say, country A. They might hire a group in country B to actually develop or actually produce the card skimmer. So we have country A who designed it, we have country A, uh, country B, who is actually creating the, the skimming device, and maybe country B hires another country, another group in country C, to actually place the skimmers around grocery stores or whatever. Um, the issue here is obvious. We have multiple countries involved. The actual mastermind, let's say, is in country A, and that's basically the person that we really want to stop. However, it's most likely the people in country C that will get arrested because we can see them doing something illegal. It takes a, a lot of um, cooperation and a lot of communication for the countries to actually work together to find out who the person in country A is um, and actually make the police officers in all the countries cooperate with each other. So this is very very easy to do actually it's very easy to talk to somebody else from another country and say hey I have this idea you pay me for the idea and then you can take it but it's very difficult for police then to go from the committing of the crime in one country and tracing it all the way back through basically the design process um, to find the originator of the idea um, that becomes very very difficult um, so 
When talking about the international nature of cybercrime, basically we're talking about communication and anonymity. Uh, technology makes global communication and coordination much, much easier. So with technology now, criminals can communicate in real time very easily and share information um, about what they want to do, make plans very, very quickly. Law enforcement or governments, on the other hand, have to go through formal processes. They each have their own jurisdiction, their own national legislation. And for those countries to work together, it becomes very, very uh, bureaucratic and very difficult to do. So we have one group that's very dynamic, can change very quickly, can make new ideas really quickly. And the police or law enforcement who are trying to stop them that have this kind of slow process to go through. But that process also ensures that they're going through a process and hopefully uh, ensuring justice is served. Um, so the motivations of actors, finally. Uh, first off, just like normally criminal, uh, criminal interactions almost always involve some sort of money uh, motivator. So money, criminals, small to large sums, uh, drive efficient global co collaboration. Um, groups will get together and work with each other, even if they don't like each other, because they know that they're going to make a lot of money. Either there's one large um, compromise, one large crime that they might commit to get a bunch of money at one time and then divide it, or um, they work together very efficiently to steal very small amounts of money from lots of different places, which adds up very quickly. Law enforcement, on the other hand, um, to investigate those crimes also costs money. So it's very difficult for law enforcement to be able to investigate, for example, someone stealing one dollar. If you steal one dollar from one victim, we can't really open a case because even just the police officer listening to you talking about your one dollar costs the, the government or the state more than one dollar just for listening services, right? So police tend to focus on large sums that make the investigation worth it, which means these kind of $1 or $20 or less, or sometimes even $300 or less cases, um, don't usually first off get reported, and second, don't get investigated very effectively because it's too expensive to do those investigations. Uh, in Korea, that's a little bit different um, because Korea has a lot of cybercrime investigators. Uh, they have at least the ability to put the manpower there to investigate these smaller cases a little bit more effectively than many other countries. Um, and politics. So first off, governments are mostly, uh, of course, influenced by their, their national but also international politics. So if two countries are not getting politically along very well, then they also won't be able to investigate with each other very well, usually. Um, so politics really dictates what we can investigate and what countries can cooperate with each other. Um, whereas criminals, you might have some politics between criminal organizations, but whenever it comes again to money, they usually set politics aside pretty well so they can both make money, uh, kind of like businesses. Um, the exceptions to those, of course, are cyber warfare and hacktivism related things where we're looking more for either government sponsored um, attacks or kind of these uh, yeah, activists essentially that are doing it for their cause. So. Whenever we're talking about international nature of cybercrime, just know that everything is real time and very difficult for us to track down where the criminals are and actually attribute um, who they are effectively. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next presentation.